All right. Uh, we're here uh, today with uh, Mike Liggett, a very active member of the Photographers Forum. And one of the things we talk about a lot at the forum is inspiration and where inspiration comes from. And for many of us, uh, it's books. Uh, Mike, like many of us, has an extension, extensive uh, collection of photography books, and he's going to share a couple with us today. Uh, he'll also tell us uh, he's also a very active exhibitor and uh, book publisher and all of those things. So he'll tell us a little bit about that. And we're going to talk about Ralph Gibson and a couple of his books today, I believe. So Mike, uh, take it away. Okay. Thanks, Ray. Um, let me do a couple of things first. I did want to talk about Ralph Gibson, who's one of my all-time favorite artists. And my first introduction to Ray was this, I think, outstanding book called The Black Trilogy. And we're actually getting a bonus today because as the name suggests, it's really three books in one. They were originally published separately and now available together as the Black Trilogy. And those are the works really that, that made Ralph Gibson's fame and, uh, and fortune as we know today. We're gonna go through those books and then also go through another book that I really liked by Ralph Gibson, Overtone, a very different book I don't think it's nearly as accessible as the images and, and uh, concepts in the Black Trilogy, but that's one of the reasons I really enjoy it, I think is um, the fact that it's, it's a little more difficult to access and it makes you think more as a viewer. So let me walk through some notes and we'll talk about the three books and look at some images. So first of all, a few background notes on Ralph Gibson. He's from LA, still active. He studied photography, he dropped out of high school when he was 16, joined the US Navy. On his first day of boot camp, he was randomly selected to attend a photography school, which he promptly flunked out of. He had to be readmitted and he did pass it. Then he was assigned as a photographer's assistant on board ship. So he spent most of his four years in the Navy, a lot of it below decks in a dark room on a rolling pitching ship, developing photographs and getting really good at it. So when he got back to the mainland and got his sea legs, it was pretty much second knowledge to him. I never cease to be amazed at like how, like some of these really incredibly accomplished photographers actually come to it. You know, it's never, or not never, but it's rarely like a straight line. It's always something happens somewhere in their youth or at some point along their, their uh, artistic journey that they stumble into photography and then all, all of a sudden they discover, hey man, this is, this is like what I do. It is amazing because um, after he was selected to attend the photography school, he said many times, I consider photography to have been my destiny I didn't choose it, it chose me. Yeah. So he was randomly selected for it. Um, and then sometime on board that first ship assignment, when he was uh, in the middle of a gale in the Atlantic, he went out on deck and I think he was quoted as saying, he raised his head to the heavens and shouted something like, I'm going to be a photographer. And that, from that point on, he really knew it was going to be his destiny. So. He did uh, spend his four years learning the art and craft of shooting and developing under adverse conditions. Went back to uh, the West Coast and his first real job was assistant to Dorothea Lang. Boy, that's... And after a, a year there with uh, one of the most famous photographers in the country, he um, moved to New York, started shooting and became an assistant to Robert Frank. Mm. Another one of our most famous photographers. The student's ready, time. the teacher appears, they say. So in his case, he got two of the best you could have found. Yeah, he did. So that just continued his education and, and his mm -hmm. interest. So he's done now over 40 books. And he's in 150 museums, got 20 major awards, including the highest awards in France and Japan. And he's become known for his, really his pairing and sequencing of images, which you'll see a lot of 
you see totally in, in the second book we discussed mm -hmm. overtones. But you'll recognize uh, his reductive imagery as uh, really reducing objects to their lowest common denominator, showing its minimalist style, very, very contrasty, very strong geometric elements. And he is still active. He's still an active photographer and teacher. So his first book, which was shot uh, around the country, a lot in New York, is part of what became the Black Trilogy. And the first book was called The Somnambulist. And it really is a sleepwalking kind of a sequence. So it has a very dreamlike quality. The images are very timeless, could have been shot in almost any decade in the past hundred years. And um, he had a hard time getting the book published. In fact, he was rejected by many publishers because at the time, back in the days of Robert Frank and Dorothea Lang, photo books were known for being documented, uh, photojournalistic. So his really cropping, his imagery, his the way that he presented the photographs, the dark moodiness uh, was rejected by one publisher after another one. So in 1970, he formed his own publishing company and um, called, I think, Luster, Lustrum Press. Lustrum Press, yeah. Yeah. and published Great books. Did a whole yeah. bunch of great books. They have, including starting with his, of course. Mm -hmm. So his, the book starts with an image that's, that's very well known, very famous, uh, but um, part of his, his dreamlike sequence. And he actually starts the first book with a page of text, the first words of which I show you here, gentle reader, a dreamlike sequence. And he's got that hand holding the pen. And he was very much conceptually seeing images as being the, the visual equivalent of words. So he really saw himself as creating a document and using photographs as a language. And I think that, that the, the opening image here really illustrates that concept. But the images in the entire book were, were very, very dreamlike. Had this surreal quality. He was very much influenced at the time by the surrealist artist in New York, and I think it shows. And this book was really a turning point. It, it created quite a sensation at the time in the photo world. And uh, he paid $4,000 at the time. He had no money. He owed nine months back rent at the Chelsea Hotel. And he had pawned two of his three Leicas. Wow. He was 30 years old, had no money, was broke. Couldn't get anybody to publish it. Borrowed money and published it himself. And from there, he, he went from an impoverished nobody to being all of a sudden famous and on his feet, doing lectures and workshops, selling prints. And, and this is pretty um, standard for the books or for the photos at the time. Uh, tight frames, unusual cropping, high contrast compositions. And in this first book, very dreamlike storytelling images. They invite you so here's a sequence of images from the book, that first book. And you can just browse through them and make up your own story for almost any one of them. He would crop unusually. He would crop off elements of, of uh, almost any body or building or figure that he would photograph, present it very dark, very moody, uh, very mysteriously. And, uh, and that became his first book, his, his Samandos. So, so it's all about dream walking, dream walking and, and the, the, the dreamlike state. And then he published his second book, Deja Vu. Deja Vu continued that dreamlike quality, but um, started out with a very stark, realistic image. So the first page of Deja Vu has this figure, again, um, could be anybody, but a very realistic, not as dreamlike, but still had a, a, um, a, an image you can make a story of. There was no text on the page. There was no preamble like there was in the first book. It was just title page and image. And then, interestingly, 
and he went to this sequence. And this is where I think you really see his sequencing starting to show itself. And his concept of using photographs as a visual language very much involved the viewer, the reader, seeing two images at once and creating their own story about it. And that's something you'll see a lot of in overtones. This particular page sequence, the right-hand guy, right-hand image, you don't know if it's guy or lady really, was somebody sitting on a pier in New York City. And on the left, it's an artist friend of his, Larry Clark, mm. playing with a gun in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Two very different landscapes, two very different photographs and pairing them together, which is something he didn't do until he was laying out the book. He never saw these images together. Didn't even dream of pairing them together. Didn't take them with that in mind, but he saw a different story when he paired them together. Then he goes into um, a very different kind of an image for him, a very angular geometric image, one of the most geometric we've seen from him so far, but you'll see a lot more of it in his career just a very stark angles and lines, um, images that I like a lot. I like the, this kind of abstract, mm -hmm. black and white uh, geometric kind of image. And it's influenced a lot of what I do now. So there's a couple of images from Deja Vu. And here is again, an overview of that book and the images. So, so browse through these visually for a minute and just look at the at the differences in the images from one to another. Look at some of the crops, look at the subjects that he chose, the darkness, the booty moodiness, still some dreamlike qualities, very much um, some diptychs in this book, but a lot of individual images standing alone on, on their own. See the lady very prominently with one eye covered and one eye open. That's a great image, I think, and, mm -hmm. and the very evocative of storytelling. You see unusual crops like the one just to the right of her where you've got this pillar and some kind of a shape behind it. But it's very typical of him to crop buildings and geometric forms to just produce these shapes and lines and let you form your own story about it. So that was his second book published three years after his first, Deja Vu. Then his third one, completing the trilogy, opens like this. Days at Sea by Ralph Gibson has a cover like this and opens to the first page with just a title and what you might presume to be maybe the stack on a ship. Now this book also invites you to see a story in it. and invite you to interpret images any way you want. The images could be part of a sea journey or they could be part of a dream of people on a long voyage after days at sea or a combination of the two. So as you go through the book, you're confronted with probably, I think in, in my case, my introduction to Ralph Gibson as a nude photographer because he became really well known later and did books of nudes, really artistic kinds of nudes. But this is the first time when you see any of his fascination with the female form in this book. And um, as you page through the book, it's a combination of, seems to be combinations of images of people on a ship and maybe what they're thinking of and what they're dreaming of and what they're doing with their days at sea. So it steps through maybe beaches, people looking over the side. Again, I think he's really enjoys the female form and thinks it's one of the, the wonders of the, of the modern world. But he also shows maybe a ship's mate or captain or who knows, you know, passenger. And then the book closes, the entire trilogy closes. Remember it started with the pen over a page it ends with this, again, bringing us to the conclusion that he wanted us to see books and photographs as 
as part of a visual language. He wasn't the first, he was not the first to consider vi uh, photographs to, to be a visual language, but I think truly more than anybody else I know, he, he absorbed that concept and promoted it and used it in his books and his images. So this was really the final sequence of his Black Trilogy. And, and there you can see in this overview, a lot more of the images in the book. And those, so you look at the one in the middle left of a hand stroking a horse. You don't know if that's a statue of a horse or a real horse or if that you know, probably wasn't on the boat, but was that part of a dream? Several figures of nude or semi-nude women and, and um, on top left is body parts and just right of that is some kind of a geometric form cropped like Ralph Gibson often did. But if you look at his cropping and where he would cut off figures and faces and lines and objects, it was very unusual. And you can see why in the 1970s, other book publishers just didn't get it. They just didn't get his vision. That was very anti-photojournalistic and very visionary and very storytelling. And I think in the 1970s, these three books really did start a revolution in, in uh, book, photo book um, assembly, photo book visioning. Um, and I think it opened the doors for lots of other people to, to come up with conceptually new books and new visions, really made it acceptable and, and commercially viable in the field. So those three books, and I really invite you, if you have not seen this, to, to buy the Black Trilogy. It's, uh, I'm fairly sure that it's, its reprint is still um, in production and still available in bookstores and certainly available online. So we segue 20 books later to a book called Overtones, which is his 24th book is first where he really utilized text with the book. And I'm going to exit here for a minute, Ray, and show what I mean by uh, his first use of text with the book. Most of, uh, about half of the images were paired with text by in, in, invited poets and authors to actually add text and pair them with photographs. So sometimes the photographs, uh, the, the text rather discussed the photographs. Sometimes they talked about Ralph Gibson, but it was his first use of trying to pair the written language and interpretation of written language and inviting people to view an image simultaneously and form perhaps a new story because that was the concept of this entire book. It was taken from a musical concept, the experience of, of hearing a new different tone when two unique tones are played simultaneously. Because as he's shown in his past books, as you saw in the photograph of the guy in the pier and the gun in the desert of New Mexico, your mind forms a different impression when it sees two images together. So this book, Overtones, was almost all diptychs, pairs of images on opposing pages. And I'm gonna go through a lot of pages of this book without too much commentary, because the point of the book is to let viewers look at pairs of images, look at them together and see if they don't pair up and the reason I think this book is harder to get into is because you'll see more with later pages. This is one of the opening pages. And I think this pair can be conceived by anybody as fitting together. You see the shape on the right, you see the hand on the left, and you see a mirroring of, of shapes and you say, yeah, I can see how that forms a pair but we have to really put our concepts of viewing images aside when we look at other pages that he has. 
and force yourself to just to look at this pair of photographs on opposing pages and consider what you see there. Is it the shapes? Are you seeing something in the face that relates to the shapes on the left, the geometry? And another pair, very different. Some of these pairs, I think, are very easy for the viewer to get. Others make you reach a little bit further. And I think the ones that are easiest are the ones that we're more used to seeing and maybe pairing together. If we were taking photographs or hanging photographs in our own home or in a gallery, we might see images like this and feel they pair naturally. Some of the other ones, I think we might not see the same thing he did. And here's a pairing that I really love. And I've discussed with other photographers who see very different things. Some see the shapes as matching up well. Some see the negative space between shapes and the cobblestones in one image as relating to maybe the street in the other one. And some people just look at the pairing and don't get it at all. So again, it's timeless. It's unusual cropping. It's dark, it's moody, it's dreamlike. It invites you to tell a story. So very typical of his images. Same thing here. Make up your own story, maybe you don't get it. Maybe you do create a story between the two. I love this pairing. These are two very well-known photographs, much reproduced, very famous, highly bid after at auctions. And I think they sequence well. Anybody can get this pairing. It's a pairing that I think goes together very, very well in the face and the lips and the nose. And that is the thing. I mean, each one of these images by itself would stand alone, but you put them together and then you have something greater than the individual sum of the parts, I think. I agree. I agree. <clears throat> this is a natural pairing, I think, in most mm -hmm. people's minds. But again, look at the unusual cropping. Crops off the figure of the left in the middle of a thumbnail and the one on the right in the middle of a nose. So unusual if you were looking at photographs on their own the photographs as a pair, they assemble, I think, very naturally. One that's a little harder to get. But I think a good visual pair. So even simple elements like the diagonal line across the top of the left, carrying on with the shoulder on the right, so your eye can kind of visually diagonally go through the two. And then the oval shapes in the middle of each one. So despite the fact that their tones and contrast are very different and the images themselves are very different, imagine Ralph Gibson taking that one on the left, having no idea what he was gonna do with it. Just another unusual crop of a geometric shape that he saw. And then later on pairing it with, with the one on the right and sensing his own story in it. You know, so while they're, I'm sorry, Mike, didn't mean to interrupt, but what, what I've been thinking about is we've been looking at this year, while they do it in two vastly different ways, really, Jerry Yulesman does the same thing. They're doing the same thing. They're photographing things that interest them and then creating something different with it mm -hmm. later. You know, when Yulesman shoots, he, you know, he doesn't know what things will be. It's only after he gets his contact sheets and he cuts them up and lays them out and does all that. Does he ever have any idea what they might be at the end? And I think Gibson probably is doing the same thing. He's just things that interest him uh, visually. And as he works with them later, it's become something else other than what it was when he originally photographed it. And I wonder if um, some of what Ralph Gibson learned from Robert Frank 
wasn't exactly that. When Robert Frank took his eight or 12,000 photographs crisscrossing the country, mm -hmm. had no idea what he was going to pair together, and then spent months storyboarding those images on the walls of his house, mm -hmm. pairing them together to see what hung together. And perhaps when, when Gibson was interning with Robert Frank, that's where he learned that process. David Allen Harvey does the same thing. Uh, he, uh, in, uh, well, of course, he lives in the Outer Banks. He, he, he does uh, all his work from there. But he has, uh, he has a bedroom in the house where he takes his little prints and just tapes them on the wall. If you've ever seen a picture or anything, with, it's just hundreds and hundreds of images just taped along the wall. And that's how he does his books. He tapes them up, lives with them for a little while, sees what he likes, rearranges them. Um, it's all very much a, 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 a continuous process. It isn't where you just go, oh, that's perfect. It takes months and they play with things for a long, long time to finally get it to where they want it to be. Good lesson for all of us. Mm -hmm. This is the only triptych in, a book, in the book. Unusual. Now what we're missing here is the text that he chose to pair with it. So if you decide to purchase this book, it is worth reading the text. As I said, some illustrate and explain the images. Some are poetic pairings that try to take the image and come up with a, a piece of text or prose or poetry to, to match with it. And some are a little more narrative about Gibson himself. But uh, it's, it's worth, as you page through this, this uh, long and, and extensive book, to, to read the text as well. I love this pairing. So the image on the left, of course, uses that technique of letting you see two different faces in profile, you know, one front on and one side profile, if you choose to view it that way. And then pairing it with that mannequin on the right, I think is, is, a, is a very easy pairing to see. This one's a little harder. So, and again, you see here, he would pair images, different formats, vertical and horizontal, different visual weights, um, all very contrast, almost all, very high contrast photographs, a lot of deep, deep shadows and, and uh, bright highlights. Here's a famous pairing. And I think, again, another one of the easier ones to understand and get. I love this one. Great. The image on the left, I think, is actually on the front, the cover of his uh, collector's edition of Toshin published nudes. So if you know Toshin, the book publisher, mm -hmm. um, they did a, a collection of his nude photographs there. I think really elegant. And, and if I remember correctly, the image on the left was at the front page. They, they published a special thousand edition of his uh, collector's edition. I think that image on the left was, was front and center. But uh, I think this is a you know wonderful pairing. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to have that on my walls. Again, create your own story. Unusual cropping, deep, deep shadows, bright highlights. Trademark Gibson. And this is actually the final pairing in the book. The last pairing in the overtoned image. I've only showed about a third, perhaps, of the pages in the book. It's a, I think there's 80 pages, more or less, in the book, and everyone is, almost everyone, uh, is a visual treat. There's a few that I don't get, honestly. Um, and I think that's, that's fair game with any photographer to, um, to, to understand every one of the photographs, I think, would be very difficult because we are not that person. We have a different vision. True. But those are you know, two of my, well, really four of my favorite books. 
the Black Trilogy was my first introduction to, to Ralph Gibson. And I highly encourage anybody to, to seek this book out and, and uh, find it in publication. And whether you like Mandarin, this, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name right, but uh, in terms of how he uses every, you know, how, how he crops pictures in his composition and so on and so forth. Um, so you can see the painting influences or, you know, abstract art influences uh, in, in all of his work. Yes, and his work that I, I has influenced me a lot. And uh, um, perhaps next time we'll talk about one of my other famous geometric abstract photographers, Brett Weston. Oh, for sure. Uh, long lineage there. Um, well, Mike, this is wonderful. Uh, thanks so much for sharing. Um, the, uh, in fact, the, um, we did an exercise with the pairings at uh, our uh, forum uh, at, at one of our meetings, and that was, uh, it was a wonderful exercise in uh, seeing, really, kind of understanding what pictures are, how they work together. Um, and again, as I said before, the, any one of these images would stand well on its own, but when you put them together, it becomes something else entirely. And well, I think thanks for hosting great. this, and I hope we can get together again in person one day, right? For the yeah, fourth. you know, I'm kind of looking forward to the day that we can all be in the room together. Um, the um, uh, uh, pandemic has sort of put a, a damper on a lot of things, uh, but uh, we're looking forward to the day where we can I'll do this in person, but in the meantime, this is actually a great use of the technology we have to um, uh, you know, share and share our, share our work and share work of other uh, photographers that uh, influence us. So, uh, Mike, I, I thank you again. I uh, look forward to doing this sometime soon. And now that we're sort of kind of getting the hang of these, I, I think we'll, we should do them more often. So, uh, once again, uh, look for Mike Liggett. Uh, you you have an exhibit coming up soon, correct? Next week, or is it open now? Or? Yeah, um, exhibit on the coast. Uh, it's a multi-artist exhibit, and if anybody's on Bald Head Island for Thanksgiving, come see us. All right, sounds great. Well, Mike, thank you again, uh, and uh, we'll we'll talk soon. Okay, take care, Ray.